You're listening to Country Music Success Stories featuring Music City mentor J.C. Don Valeris. Now, here's your host, Candy O'Terry. Welcome back to part two of our live interview series at the Glen Campbell Museum in Nashville, Tennessee. We were so honored to be a part of the week-long tribute to the life and music of Glen Campbell. The Glen Campbell Museum is a must-see for country music fans. As soon as you walk in the door, well, it's like a feast for the eyes and the ears. You'll see Glenn's glittering show costumes, his guitars, his Grammys, his album covers, his Bible, letters from presidents, and of course, you'll hear his music. You can even sing like a rhinestone cowboy right along with Glenn in a recording booth. What you are about to hear is our up-close and personal interview with Glenn Campbell's widow, Kim. Glenn died of Alzheimer's disease on August 8, 2017, and although we never got the chance to interview him on Country Music Success Stories, Kim gave us a look into the life and music of Glenn Campbell behind the scenes, with the kinds of details only a wife can share. She is Glenn's wife of 34 years. She is the mother of three of his children, and as she said in his eulogy, he was the love of her life. Please join me in welcoming Kim Campbell. You know, we look around this museum and we're surrounded by all of these things, Glenn, and I know it's been a couple of years. Is it hard still? Well, I miss him every single day. I think about him every day, dream about him at night. So memory is a fickle thing. I mean, it can bring you so much joy. The reminders of something that you've lost can bring you a lot of pain as well. So you have to make a a choice. And so I choose to embrace it and just hold it as a reminder of his love and everything that he brought to my life. So it's, it's a very warm feeling to be here in the museum. We want to know about Kim Campbell. So take us back to your days in New York City as a dancer. I went to East Carolina University and majored in dance and got my first job in New York doing Snow White and the Seven Dwarves at Radio City Music Hall. Woo-hoo! It was the first Disney show ever done on Broadway, Broadway contract, and it was a lot of fun. I was a beaver. I got to chase the dwarfs around, (laughs) sing with Snow White. But um, after that, we did a show called America at Radio City, and so I was dancing with the Rockettes, and it was a dream come true. It's the most fabulous theater in the world. What is it like to be on that stage? It's... Phenomenal. It's just phenomenal. It, it's so beautiful. It has four elevators, a turntable, a fire curtain, a rain curtain. Uh, the orchestra pit drops. It can come up and then it can move to the back and then raise again. I don't know how it's engineered, but it, it was just a, a dream come true to be at Radio City Music Hall. Tell us a little bit about how you met Glenn. Well, my best friend from college had just started dating his banjo player, Carl Jackson. And Glenn had come up to New York with his band to do a show. And he brought his parents with him to New York. He wanted to spend a week and show them some shows and everything. So anyway, I got a chance to visit with Carl and Lynn. And I said, what are y'all doing tomorrow night? And they said, well, we're going to go see James Taylor with some people in the band. And I'm like, James Taylor? I love Boston James guy. Taylor. Thank you. Okay. And so I begged them to fix me up with someone in the band. <laughs> and so they kind of winked at each other and said, we'll see what we can do. And then they called me up and said, okay, you're going to see James Taylor. And I said, well, who am I going with? And they said, we're not going to tell you. So I was in suspense, but I didn't care because I was going to see James Taylor. <laughs> so they picked me up the next night. And on the way there, they said, we fixed you up with Glenn Campbell. And I didn't know much about him. You know, I knew he was a singer, but I thought, James Taylor. (laughs) We got to the Waldorf, and his mom and dad let us into his suite. And then a few minutes later, Glenn burst into the room with the guitar singing, like a rhinestone cowboy. (laughs) No way. And I looked at him, and I thought, he is gorgeous. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. And it was pretty much love at first sight, you know, stars and fireworks, the whole bit. And so we went out to dinner before going to the show, and 
when our food came, Glenn bowed his head and gave thanks. And I thought, oh, my goodness. I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> it had only been a few weeks earlier that I had been walking down the streets of New York with two of my fellow dancer friends on each side. We were kind of half-jokingly offering up these prayers to God. So one of them said, dear God, please send me my knight in shining armor. And the other one said, dear God, please send me my Prince Charming. And then I thought about it for a minute, and I said, dear God, please send me a Southern, good-looking, Christian millionaire (laughs) (laughs) that I can be in love with, and he can be in love with me. And there I was having dinner with Glenn Campbell. And sometimes God listens. Yeah. Later on that night, I realized I should have added a few more things to that (laughs) prayer. (laughs) <laughs> who is not an alcoholic um, because I had a tiger by the tail. But we fell in love and started dating, and I called my dad. I said, Dad, I'm dating this guy who is 22 years older than me. He's been married three times, and he has five children. One is older than me, and one is a baby. Do you think that's okay? <laughs> He said, well, who is it? I said, it's Glenn Campbell. He said, Glenn Campbell, the entertainer? I said, yes. He was quiet for a second. And then he said, it's fine. It's fine. Age is just a number. And so I had his blessing, and we were engaged within six months and moved to Phoenix. He had just bought a house there and had to find a a pastor to marry us. So we started going to North Phoenix Baptist Church. And with God's help, Glenn gave his life to the Lord and became the best husband and father. God delivered him from alcoholism and drug addiction. He was an amazing husband and father. And we had such a happy life together. It was an incredible education to be with Glenn Campbell. I didn't know anything about country music But I became a big country music fan as soon as he introduced me to the music of Merle Haggard and George Jones. And we were traveling with all these people. My life was amazing with him. Well, the Glenn that we know was always on a stage or coming out of our kitchen radio or our car radio. But can you describe to us the private Glenn Campbell, the guy that was off tour, home on a Sunday, hanging out with you and the kids? What was he like? He was a crack up. He was one of the funniest people you'd ever meet. And he loved jokes more than anybody in the world. And one of the biggest challenges that anybody could have would be to tell him a joke he hadn't heard already. And boy, if you did, it delighted him beyond words. He had to tell everybody that joke. But he he was just innately funny. And he was loving and kind and generous and full of energy. You know, if he was sitting down, he was asleep. What about disciplinarian? Like, which one of you was the disciplinarian in the I don't house? know. Cal? <laughs> My, our son Cal is here. Who would you say? He's not talking. Silence. It's <laughs> silence. Okay. <laughs> I've, I've, been told, <laughs> I've been told I was the heavy. But, it, but Glenn was my backup. All right. If they didn't do what I said, I'd go get him. You mentioned that when you met Glenn at the Waldorf, he came busting in singing Rhinestone Cowboy. But I'm wondering... Because I think it's awfully romantic when you're married to Glenn Campbell. Were there quiet times when you guys were just hanging out together and and he would just sing to you? Yes. He sang to me all the time. Played me mostly Jimmy Webb songs. And they were beautiful. He owned some of Jimmy Webb's very first published music. I had the shopping bag full of cassette tapes that were all Jimmy Webb demos. He was always trying to find new ways to do those songs. I want to talk to you a little bit about motherhood. You mentioned Cal, your son is here in the audience tonight. You also have two other children, Ashley and Shannon. How did motherhood change you? I don't know. It was just delightful. They were such a joy to both of us. We took them everywhere we went. We took them on the road with us. And that was my world. It's my three children. Um, I was very hands-on. I did a little bit of homeschooling. And we spent a little time in Branson, Missouri, You know, he would go there for six weeks at a time or something at at one period of our lives. The reason we did it is because we could take our kids and stay in one place. And and so I I homeschooled him when we did that. But it was so much fun, you know, taking Ashley to ballet classes and Cal to drum lessons. And Glenn helped coach T-ball for the for the boys. And yeah, Glenn and Alice Cooper. 
They were buddies. Wait a minute. They were golf and buddies. Alice Cooper were buddies and they were coaches? Yes, and we went to the same church. Alice and Cheryl went to North Phoenix Baptist Church with us. And so did Al Jardine, by the way. So we were in good company. What a great story. And all three of your children are immensely musically talented. Do you remember seeing their talent for the first time when they were children? And how did you encourage that within them? Well, it blew us away because they started writing songs early on, and they were fabulous. Ashley was shy about it. I remember she was probably about 13 when she finally let us hear her sing. She stood in her bedroom and closed the door and made sure we were on the other side. She didn't (laughs) want us to see her singing. And we thought, oh, my goodness, she's, She's she's great. She was just shy about it, but... She's an incredible banjo player, singer, songwriter, and incredible person. And Cal actually tours with Beck. Mm -hmm. So that's a dream job for him. And Shannon's out in L.A. making music. He's an incredible guitar player. Glenn couldn't have been prouder of him. Was it a balancing act to try to protect them from being compared to their father? I never really consciously thought about it. I just wanted my kids to grow up feeling normal, you know? And for the most part, I think they did. One of the things that I think everyone who was on stage before you talked about was Glenn's generosity. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Well, let's see. When I first started dating him, we went to get a hamburger at a little restaurant. And he paid the bill, and then he left a 50 on the table. And I said, honey, don't you think that's a little bit much (laughs) to leave for a tip? And he looked at me with a little defiance in his eyes. He pulled out a 100 and put it on the table. And I thought, okay, (laughs) I get it. All right. So if he wanted to bless somebody, then he was going to bless them. And he liked to bless people. So I, I learned a lot from him. So if Glenn were sitting here right now on this stage with us, and I know there's so many aspiring artists in Nashville and some in the audience tonight, what advice do you think Glenn would give to an aspiring artist wanting to have a career like his someday? It's all about the song. He would tell people to look for me, I songs, songs told from the first person perspective and songs, boy, girl songs, songs about love. He liked front phrasing rather than back phrasing. And he would say, sing it like you're talking it. Tell a story. Mostly he chose the right ones. That's for sure. When did you start noticing, Kim, that something was happening for Glenn cognitively? Well, they say Alzheimer's starts to develop as early as 20 years before diagnosis. And I did notice some strange things, but they would be like a little glitch that would happen here. And you just think, you know, we all have odd things, odd moments, memory lapses. I remember when we were still living in Phoenix, he asked me where something was, and I said it. It's in the garage. And he said, what's a garage? I'm like, what do you mean, what's a garage? It's where you keep your car. He goes, oh, yeah, yeah. He says, well, where is it? And <laughs> so that, that's, yeah, strange, that's strange, you know? Yeah. But it was out of the blue. We'd go out to dinner with friends, and he would tell the same stories over and over. But he was a great storyteller, so no one really minded. But it was odd. So, it, you know, it was this very slow progression Did he start noticing it in his work? Did he start forgetting a lyric or anything like that? Yeah, he he would say, what key is this in? And he was the best musician in the world. I mean, he could play in any key for sure, even with Alzheimer's, you know. Then he would start forgetting the lyrics to songs he had sung thousands of times. Mm -hmm. Then there were other little things, early signs, like he became very OCD about Mm -hmm. certain things like, how the bathroom towels were hung up. Everything had to be perfectly trifolded or something. This is a guy from Arkansas who grew up with an outhouse, (laughs) who never gave a rip about how to hang the towels, you know. All of a sudden, everything had to be perfect, but he needed order. Right. And he wanted me to keep everything out on the countertops in the bathroom, and I wanted to put them in the medicine cabinet, in the drawers, and have everything pretty and nice and clean, you know. And he would get really angry with me for putting things away. He said, I want them out where I can see them. You know, but I didn't know it's because he couldn't remember where they were. So little things like that. And trying to control what you can when you feel like other things are falling out of your control, right? Yeah. The decision to allow cameras 
into your home and onto the tour and into your lives. It wasn't just something that was going to affect you and Glenn. It was the whole family. So take us all into that moment when you decided you were going to do the goodbye tour and you were going to bring cameras along for this journey. Well, we had just finished this beautiful album, Ghost on the Canvas, produced by Julian Raymond. And uh, we were all set to go out and do a five-week tour to promote the album when we got the diagnosis. And it was devastating, and it was scary. And, you know, like most people who get that diagnosis, you have to make a decision. Am I going to quit and retreat from society and, and just seclude myself? Or what am I going to do? So, so we had a big meeting, and Glenn said, well, I'm going to go out and do my music with my band. He said, I feel fine. I said, well, honey, what if you do something weird? You know, we don't know what to expect from this disease. He said, well, if I do something weird, I'll just tell everybody I got Alzheimer's. And I thought, well, there's a concept, you know, just be open and honest about it. So it was his idea to go public with the diagnosis. And then Julian, um, he had been helping James Keach and his then wife, Jane Seymour, with their son's music. So he talked to James about the idea of documenting this. Really, it was a a brave and courageous thing to go out and do a tour after receiving a diagnosis of Alzheimer's. And it might be his last concert ever, and so or last tour ever. So I think it was a really great idea that Julian had to ask James, would you consider documenting this tour? And he brought that idea to Glenn and and set up a meeting so that we could meet them. And it was magical. We went over to Jane and James's house there in Malibu. They just lived down the street from us. And they were so loving and warm and inviting. And really, James didn't want to do it at first idea of it because he thought it's going to be so depressing and so sad. You know, why would anybody want to watch a documentary about Glenn Campbell having Alzheimer's? But once he met Glenn and he realized how optimistic and positive and funny Glenn was, he thought, well, this could be a totally different kind of a take on facing adversity and challenges in your life. So they thought, well, it's only five weeks. Let's do it. But once we got out there, Glenn was so amazing and we were having so much fun and music was just so healthy for Glenn that they kept adding dates and adding dates and five weeks turned into almost two years of touring. And so in the film, you'll see the progression of the disease from the early stages to the middle stages. It was quite an adventure and the film is so funny and educational, heartwarming, and it won a Grammy for best soundtrack. Mm -hmm. And Julian and Glenn, of course, nominated for an Oscar for I'm not going to miss you. It was so much fun, and it was something that, you know, for our family, Glenn and I and our three children, it bonded us in such a beautiful way, and we were able to just enjoy him and celebrate him while we had him with us. It was wonderful. In preparation for meeting you and and everyone here, I wanted to make sure that I watched the movie again, and what I was most struck by was the love that your children have for their father and how protective they were on stage. You did a lot of things right as a mom because these kids were so generous and so protective, and yet they honored their father so much. They never stepped on him, they just guided him. Talk a little bit about that. Well, we tried to prepare for everything, just in case. And when you're on stage, the lights are blinding you in the eyes. So we wanted to make sure that Glenn stayed safe. So Ashley was wireless, Shannon, On the other side, he played guitar. He was wireless, just in case Glenn got too close to the edge of the stage because your death perception can become affected if you have Alzheimer's. He never did, but we had that covered just in case. We had other tricks up our sleeve. We had to make sure there were never any children in the front row because if there were, the entire show would be sung as Donald Duck Uh, because he loved children, and he loved to do Donald Duck to children. (laughs) But a soft light to let him see the audience's faces was really helpful because he loved people. And if he could see the people, he was Mr. Entertainer. You know, he was telling jokes and and singing his heart out to them. He just loved to make people happy. One of the things that you said in the movie was, you know, I feel like I'm a stage mom 
because I'm running around chasing after this guy because there were times as the disease progressed that he would go kind of off the handle and be running down the hallway and knocking on people's doors and that must have been hard on you. It was difficult many times on the bus or in the hotel room trying to make sure he stayed in the room because people with Alzheimer's will wander and get lost. And so we had to watch him every second. And he would say to me, are we doing a show tonight? Yes, it's 7 o'clock. Okay. Are we doing a show tonight? You know, this gets a little tedious after about an hour. It was so amazing because once we got him to the edge of the stage and the lights came up and the intro to Gentle on My Mind started to play, it was like he was back. Music brought him back. And he walked onto that stage and he was a pro. He loved the music. He loved to, like I said, make people happy. And the audience loved him back. It was beautiful. One of the things that I noticed in the movie was doctors explaining that they felt that the area of Glenn's brain that was musical was so incredibly strong that it carried him much longer through the disease than a normal person's would. Do you agree? I absolutely agree, yes. It does help your brain globally. Mm. Music stimulates the brain, and it, it helped him. Let's talk a little bit about Abe's Garden community, because I know it's very special. We're encouraging everyone, whenever you can, to please support Abe's Garden community, because that's where Glenn found community and where your family found help and advocacy. Talk a little bit about your connection to this great organization. Well, as I said, the film takes you through the early and middle stages of the disease, but when we entered the late stages, it became really impossible for me to care for Glenn at home, even though I had five people living with me, helping me around the clock. Some people with Alzheimer's can become combative and agitated all the time. They don't know daytime from nighttime. They're wandering. They're trying to escape. It was extremely difficult. And so the doctor, the neurologist here at Vanderbilt said, I think you should look into long-term care. Well, I had never, ever dreamed of anything like that. But long story short, when we came to Abe's Garden, I realized that I didn't put my husband in a home. I didn't place him in a facility. Our family joined a memory community. And so it was my community, too. And it was a place where we were with other families on that same journey. And we were there to support each other, to love each other, to pray for each other. And so it was a beautiful thing. And Glenn loved being there with other people. He liked socialization, and they have a music household, which was perfect for him. The day before he passed away, two musicians from the Nashville Symphony came and were playing the most beautiful music you could ever imagine in the live room outside his door. And I just opened the door and let all that music flow in, and it it was a beautiful, beautiful thing. It was like God was ushering him in to his kingdom with music once again. So Abe's Garden was really wonderful for us. Your book is called Gentle on My Mind. Did the book help heal you? And do you feel as if some of the work that you've done has really helped you to become an advocate in the fight against Alzheimer's disease? Definitely. Anytime you help other people facing the same challenges that you are, it bonds you with them and it helps you be a stronger person as well. And the book was a delight because it helped me, I think, do some healing. It helped me in the grieving process to remember all the good times that we had together as well as the bad. And I hope it's a blessing to other families that face the same things, whether it's conquering drug addictions or alcoholism or facing a disease like Alzheimer's. When we had TK and Julian and Mike up here, we talked a little bit about the flavor of Glenn's voice, the depth of his talent, his presence, the it factor, all those things. What was the magic of Glenn Campbell for you and for your family? Just his loving heart. He just, he loved people and he loved me so much. He made me know how much he loved me every single day. So it was wonderful, and he was a great father. Final question for you. If we had had the chance to interview Glenn, at the end of our shows, we always ask the question, 
fill in the blank. The key to my success in country music has been what? What would Glenn Campbell have said to that question? Well, he'd probably say, was my ability to use a capo. (laughs) (laughs) He was very modest, but he always said that capo is what enabled him to be in the wrecking crew and and amaze all those other musicians because he could play in any key just by moving the capo, you know? I think that's being very modest. I want to say thank you so much to Kim Campbell. Let's hear it for Kim Campbell. This episode of Country Music Success Stories is dedicated to Glenn Campbell. Thank you so much. Thanks Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming out to the Glenn Campbell Museum. And that's part two of our live podcast, recorded at the Glenn Campbell Museum as part of their week-long tribute to the life and music of Glenn Campbell. Our thanks to the museum for partnering with us on these episodes. If you're in Nashville, a stop at the Glen Campbell Museum is a must. We hope you'll tell your family and friends about country music success stories. Please subscribe so you never miss an episode. Follow us on social at Country Music Success Stories. Our TikTok handle is at Candy and JC. The series is now available on the Country Line app, so please download it for all things country music. We've got more legends to meet and stories to tell. This is Candy O'Terry. And I'm JC Don Valeris. Thank you for listening to Country Music Success Stories. Where the stars welcome us into their homes and tell us how they made it in Nashville. <laughs>